Doug Cunnington here, and this is The Doug Show Live. We're going to talk about some affiliate marketing things, some random stories for the week. Welcome, welcome, and if you could hear me, please let me know in the chat. Let me know uh, where you're from. Say hello. Quick note about questions. I will answer some questions at the end, but if you ask questions, uh, number one, there's no need to repeat them. And there's some people that may be in the chat and they'll help you out. They'll maybe send you some links. And there's a website that I have called Niche Site Project. And you can go to nichesiteproject.com slash FAQ for frequently asked questions. So sometimes people may point you in that direction. So today we're gonna talk about several different things. I am uh, buying a house soon. So we had to go through some exercises with basically, <laughs> basically doing paperwork. So working with lenders, we are talking to insurance companies and all these other you know people that we have to contact. So there's a lot of that going on in or during the process. I had to call to get some home insurance. So have a little story about that and working with insurance companies. There's a uh, new conference coming up. It's called the Financial Freedom Conference. And at this point in time, it's still on. And I'll mention that a little bit. I recently joined Toastmasters. So I'll tell you a little story about that. I gave my first speech in one of the meetings. It was a little scary, but we did okay. I did okay. We'll talk about writing content. And I have a lot of highlight reels. Some some of them are not yet published. There's a very, very exciting set of videos coming out next week where I'm tearing down a public case study Amazon affiliate site. So should be pretty cool. I think you guys probably know which site it is. We're going to show a clip from that. So we got Gary on what's going on. Car kits, what's happening. Dan, we got J and K. I haven't heard from you in a while. Hope things are well. We got Chad, Gustavo, Tosh, Mike. And uh, Mike's been on two live streams in a row. Outstanding. And then we have Umar, what's going on? Thanks everyone for hopping on. And if we have time, we may do a couple uh, sort of like little live demos. And one thing that I am interested in getting questions about, especially as comments, but if you put it in the chat, that'll be just fine as well. If you have any questions about content, writing content, editing content, hiring a content manager, hiring a team to do content writing, anything related to that. I know a lot of people are very interested in either outsourcing or working in a more efficient, effective way if they're doing the writing themselves. So if you have questions on content, please, please ask them. I'll probably be putting together several videos around the topic of content. We have Cash, what's up? Derek, Islam, and Edward. Edward said you found that Trappist beer. That's fantastic. Super cool. All right. Let's get into some of the some of the stuff today. And by the way, if you're if you're brand new to these live streams, I usually do them every every Friday and cover some random topics. Usually we have some good questions pop in. You'll see up here uh, right there. That's my website, Niche Site Project. If you go to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, you could enter your name and email address, and I'll send you all the templates. By the way, like most of this stuff that I talked about with content, I have templates, I have information on that, but it's interesting how the YouTube audience doesn't usually go over to the blog, even though that's where like the most valuable information is because I could show you a template on a video, but it's not as useful as if you just got it in your inbox and you have the template right there and you can just make a copy of it. So we got Marty on what's up. Good to see ya. And let's hop over here, start talking about insurance quotes. So it's a pain to work with insurance companies. Has anyone had to make a claim? Let me know in the chat. Or if you're watching the, the replay, let me know if you've had to make a claim with an insurance company. They usually are not great to work with. So whenever they're selling you something, they're your best friend. They wanna help you, they wanna protect your investment, they wanna protect your health, 
They want to save you and your family. But if you ever need their help, they're not super helpful. They usually will deny you. All right. They're usually, they're usually not on your side when you're actually trying to get money from them. So the, the thing is, once you sign up for, uh, say, auto insurance. So you sign up for auto insurance and they slowly raise your rate. It's kind of a, a thing that they do. Very common. They will have a low rate for you when you sign up. And then each year, every six months or whatever, they'll raise it a little bit. So there are companies like Geico, for example, and this is based on my own personal experience. This is for entertainment purposes only. But basically, I called into Geico um, because I got an insurance quote from some affiliated insurance company from the new home that I'm going to purchase. So they, they gave me a quote. The affiliated company gave me a quote for home insurance. So I called up Geico and they gave me a much higher quote. I was like, well, that, that doesn't sound awesome. So can you, can you lower the rate a little bit? The answer was no. They couldn't lower the rate at all. Well, that didn't seem quite right, but we, we just went with the other company. So we also have our auto insurance with Geico. So I called up and they were like, oh, we, we have this uh, specific rate for you. And uh, hold on, let me check all the other rates in the area. Um, I'll automatically check it for you. And they're, of course, they say, yep, I checked all the other rates and this is the lowest rate. How do you want to pay for it today? That is how quick the transition was. They said, I checked everything. Do you want to pay with a Visa or MasterCard? And I was like, actually, I want to, I want to shop around a little bit because it seems like that's weird that you give me the lowest rate and you checked everything because I know their incentive is to get me to close the deal right then. They don't really want me to shop around. And I thought to myself, what if they're, what if they are just checking the published rates? Because I know if I call into another insurance company, they will end up saying, you know what? We, we will match or beat Geico. Because if you're, it's like if you're dealing with a used car uh, salesman or salesperson, they don't want you to leave. Once you leave, it's very hard for them to close the deal again. So if I'm on the phone and I'm like, hey, I'm going to call around, they know that I'm going to find a lower rate, which I did. So the, the moral of the story here is if you get some sort of high pressure, especially from a company like Geico or similar, where they say, hey, I checked everything out for you, just remember what their goals are. They want to close the deal right then. They don't actually care about you. I mean, think about when you dealt with an insurance company. They're just trying to keep money for their shareholders and they want to they want to get you in the door and get your premiums, but they don't want to pay you out. They'll work as hard as they can. Again, think about it. Just if you've ever tried to make an insurance claim, it's usually not working out that well, right? They, they don't want to give you money. You have to negotiate. Um, and, and it's been a while since I've had to work with an insurance company, but I was in a car accident many years ago. It wasn't my fault. Someone uh, rear-ended me, I think. And the insurance company like gave me an offer. They gave me an offer pretty quick. And I was like, you know what? I'm not happy with that offer. So I, I sort of played, I wasn't sure like how to negotiate or do any sort of, uh, I guess, working with them, but I ended up letting them know what I wanted. I wanted more. I don't remember how much, but I wanted more. And then I was a little bit hard to reach. I wasn't returning their phone calls super quick. And generally I was treating them how the insurance companies normally treated me because I knew they wanted to close that quick and they wanted to make sure I waived the rest of my rights and just settled at that point. So I waited and I dragged it out a little bit longer, which probably makes them nervous. I assume they imagine I'm working with a lawyer or something similar. So that worked out uh, pretty well. They ended up giving me something like 80% more than what their initial offer was. And that was when I knew nothing about negotiation other than I imagine they were trying to lowball me early on. So anyway, just remember that if you're ever, if you call into Geico and they say, hey, I checked everything for you, they may have checked everything for you, 
as far as published rates, but I'm pretty sure you could call around and do better elsewhere. So that's my insurance story for today. I see there's a lot of activity in the chat. So I'm going to hop back over there in a few minutes and I'm going to play a clip. Clips have been super popular. We have some awesome ones coming out today or sorry, next week. And we have some very good highlight clips for today. Last, uh, I guess it was last week I interviewed Matt Jevanisi over from Money Lab. And he also is a co-host at Listen Money Matters. Really great guy. People love the episode. And this is a little note about, or it's a clip. And we talk about his about page and kind of his whole journey as an online marketer. So I know there's a lot of folks that are, you know, trying to make your first, you know, thousand dollar a month, hundred dollar a month, maybe just make your first couple sales. So Matt started at the very beginning from nothing. He didn't know anything about digital marketing and he's doing really well at this point in time. In fact, one of his biggest sites is a swim university, which you can go check out and review and look at. I'm actually probably going to do some teardowns pretty soon on that site. And at this point it's making over 250,000 per year, right? 250,000 per year, just from that one site. And Matt's a really nice guy. Remember he started from zero, just like everyone else. So here's Matt Jevanisi from moneylab.co. Yes, my about page is so there's there are two different things, but my about page was like, I'm just gonna tell you who I am. I'm gonna be funny about it. And then I'm gonna tell you I set rules for myself just in, in business. And I have those rules in there. They're based off the uh wildy wildy coyote roadrunner rules. I call roadrunner rules from Chuck uh <laughs> Jones. And and then I, you know, I have products that I that I use. I'm not saying I recommend them, just that's what I use. And then I created this timeline, which I get, I, you know, the timeline people are, are very like, this is, it just, it's one of those things that like, you mentioned authenticity earlier. I heard that before and I'm like, I'm just going to do that. That's so, that is so the easiest freaking thing to do. And honesty is something I practiced in life. So why wouldn't I do that? On, why would I lie on the internet? It doesn't make any sense. And so I was like, I kept reading these sort of where these ideas come from is sort of is the zeitgeist of the world that we operate in. And you hear like, I, I wasn't successful overnight. It took me years to get this, but you only see, you know, and everyone's like, don't listen to these gurus. Like they didn't get successful overnight. Like, and I always had this idea for a book, like, you know, it was like the, my, my book biography that I'll never write called like an overnight success, 14 years that it takes took or 17 years to whatever, like or a 17 year overnight success or something. like. That. And so I was like, okay, well let's show people how, how long it really took and how many mistakes and how many like derailments that it really took to get where I am today. Instead of saying that like, Hey, you come on the money lab. Wow. He's got swim university. He's got money lab. He's got brew cabin. Like this guy can, he's, you know, Wow, I want to, I want that life too. He didn't even go to college. He didn't even go to college. How can this be done? You got 20 years? This is how it's done. Exactly, I mean, exactly how I did it. And so, yeah, I found this timeline like code that I liked and I was like, "Okay, I'm just going to kind of put down all of the really stupid things that I did and make it funny and make it like, "Hey, I I remember I joined a community and I got hit by Panda here and I bought this book about AdSense and I started this uh, social network for dogs and I you know had a rock band that failed after four years because I wanted to really be a rock star and not an affiliate marketer and you know like I, I just kind of bounced back and forth like oh and then I had this and I made my first hundred dollars a month and then I got you know hit with this thing and it was just like and it I, it's more of like entertainment for sure but it also points out that and I and I and if anybody ever asked me you know it's like oh I you know you know, how long does this take? How long, you know, or because I don't, the thing is, is like what I want Money Lab to be is a place that kind of like, and this is what from the very beginning of it, I don't want, and not, not to discriminate. I don't want newbies on my site thinking that they can be me. They can make the same amount of money that I'm making on these experiments because I have a list of, you know, people I, ha I have like these assets that I've been building over time. And the way that I sort of filter those people out is by creating content that's sort of like 
a little bit, no, I don't want to say over their head because it's not, but it kind of just really just gives you the reality of it. I've had people who bought the affiliate marketing course and return it because they're like, too many steps. And I'm like, oh, you thought this shit was easy. Well, I don't even know how you found me, but if you if you know anything about me or you know my my brand, you know that like I when I do an experiment, like I talk about how much it sucks. And the thing that I really dislike about online entrepreneurship, especially when you you know, I shouldn't say that guru-ness or you know i call it hero worship or it's like you look at these people like pat flynn like somebody that i had looked up to when i first started too like corbett Barr from fizzle like these are people that you know i found the them and i was like cool that's the that's a good life and i read the four hour work week like everyone else it's like i like a lot of ideas here do i worship any of those people absolutely not you know like they're human like i am but everyone just like kind of looks up to them and says like I want to do what they do and they will say, you know, they'll go on and not, I'm not, I don't want to point out Pat or anybody in particular, but they tend to go on the internet, try something, fail, and then talk about what they've learned and spin it into a positive. It's like, Oh, you know, I did this thing and you know, I don't have any regrets because you know what I learned? I learned that what's important in life is blah, 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 blah. And I don't, I hate that. Just tell me that what you did, you fucked up and it sucked. The whole thing was horrible and you wish you didn't do it. Be that guy because that's what you're really thinking. But for your audience, you're, you're trying to spin it into a positive because you don't want to look like a fool. You don't want to look like somebody who did the wrong thing. And I am telling you like this podcasting experiment, I'm pretty sure I'm doing the wrong thing. Like I already know I'm doing the wrong thing. But what if I do the right thing? But what if I do the, it, what if I, I say it's wrong now, I do it, and then, <laughs> and then I am wrong, and I go, you know what, that sucked. Instead yeah. of going like, but, you know, I got one or two sales, so it was pretty good. No, it wasn't good. That's not good. It's not success. That's stupid. Like, just say, just say it sucks. Say you messed up. Say you, say you chose something. But again, like, I can use it as content. I can say, okay, well, I did this. Didn't work. Shut it down. Shut it down. Like, it's like, and, then I, and just be honest that, like, you could try it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Sure. You know? And I also try to, on Money Lab, extrapolate myself from recommending or giving advice to anyone because I have this like blanket statement in my head when people email me and they're like, hey, I had this idea for blank. What do you think? And I go, I don't know. Try it. Let me know how it turns out. That's my three sentences that I send to people who ask me questions like that because the truth is I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I mean... So, you know, everyone says like, oh, some university, what a perfect niche you chose. I'm like, I didn't choose it I didn't choose that niche. I was 13 years old and my friend's neighbor worked at this local pool store. And she's like, do you kids want jobs? Because I have jobs at this pool store. And we're like, yeah, pools. I don't know. And we and I stuck with it, you know, and it's like pools chose me, not not the other way around, you know. Right on. So, you know, it's like I didn't go and like, you know, you walk around the house and you like write down like, what am I interested in? What what do I have in my house? Like, oh, I have an elliptical. Machine. And that was Matt Jevanisi. Check out that full interview. The guy is just full of knowledge. Amazing dude. Super nice. Very into beer. And <laughs> like he said, he he didn't choose the pool niche. He chose him. And he stuck with it for a long time, as, as he mentioned there. He was like 13 year old, 13 years old when he started working in the pool shop. And Joe, yes, it's okay to ask a question. Make sure it's good. I'm a ball buster, and I will tell you that right now. I may not come back to the question until I'm ready, but feel free, my man, to ask the question. And if it's something that I've already answered in the past, someone like Marty, my friend Marty, he can point you in the right direction. So yes, Joe, feel free to ask the question. Quick note, I want to point out that there is a phone number that you can leave me a voicemail. I put it in the chat and I'll read it out. It's 406-813-0613. The ideal length of a question is 90 seconds. If you go beyond uh, like three minutes, it will cut you off. There's a three minute limit. So think of a question. I'll play it on my podcast. At this point in time, I've played every single voicemail that came in the door. Some of them required a little more editing, but write down your question, time yourself, read it. If it's 
over two minutes, trim it down, only read the essential part and it'll be better for everyone. But leave a voicemail, love getting them. I'm gonna be recording some episodes since we're in lockdown situation. And I'm gonna get ahead on, on a few of these, but love getting the questions and you get a shout out. Usually I'll send you a text message back if you have that capability. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, Financial Freedom Conference in St. Louis. I just wanna mention it, I am an affiliate any products that I mention, I'm probably an affiliate for. At this point in time, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if it's gonna going to be scheduled. It's it's um, May 1st through the 3rd. And my friend Cody Berman is one of the organizers. So let me share my screen. Hopefully this is gonna work. Yes, the Financial Freedom Conference. So this is kind of kind of a big deal. It's in St. Louis. May 1st through the 3rd. And if you've enjoyed some of the people that I've interviewed recently around financial independence, you will like this conference. There's some big hitters, some huge names, and it's it's amazing. It's sort of in conjunction with some of the same organizers as FinCon. So a lot of us have probably heard of FinCon. I may be attending that this year myself in September in uh, I think it's Southern California area. I'm not 100% sure where, but some of the same folks are putting this on so you could expect the same high quality. It is the first year of this Financial Freedom Summit. However, because they've done so many conferences in the past and they have high caliber speakers, I think it's gonna be fantastic. So we'll take a quick look at some of the speakers because that was kind of the most impressive thing to me. You may have seen um, like one of the main organizers. It's uh, Grant Sabatier. It's this guy right here. And he wrote a book recently. So here you'll probably just recognize some of the names. Vicki Robin, very famous author of Your Money or Your Life. J.D. Roth, Get Rich Slowly. And we're not, I'm not going to scroll too, too far here. Here's uh, Cody, who I interviewed. That episode will be coming out in a few weeks. So he has a pretty pretty awesome podcast called uh, The Fi Show. He has a, a co-host as well, but Cody will be speaking. And anyway, check it out if you're in the area. It's sort of a no-brainer. I do know a couple people who are going to be attending. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it over, but I, I might. I might be over there. So be sure to check it out if you have any interest in connecting with people that are into the financial freedom topic area looks like a great group of people and there's a link in the description to you know get over there so if you're interested check it out there all right and tiff mentioned earlier so i'm going to give tiff a shout out where is it at so using the kgr the keyword golden ratio on her new site she launched it in december of 2019 two articles are on the first page of google one is number one and one of them is the featured snippet. So that's Tiff Wilson giving her a shout out here for taking action. She has 14 sales so far. All right, pretty cool, pretty cool. So congratulations, Tiff, keep at it. I think you'll see things things grow faster and faster the more, more work you put in. It's funny how that works. I recently joined Toastmasters because I was, I was supposed to speak at the Ezoic Pub Intelligence conference at a Google site, Google New York City. I was very excited. I don't understand. We have a Google Home, and sometimes she talks to me when I don't want her to. So I was going to go to New York, but Google canceled, like many companies, canceled all big gatherings, conferences, sort of indefinitely, and no rescheduling in the short term. So unfortunately, it's going to be rescheduled or at least postponed for a while, but I was going to do a 30 minute talk and I've never done public speaking before other than live streams, which is a different animal. It's much easier to stare into my, my laptop, just a webcam here, much easier than a bunch of people out in an audience, real people looking at you, judging you every step of the way. So I joined Toastmasters last week. And it was cool, nice little group. Um, there were about eight or so people at uh, each of the meetings that I've been to. And I immediately joined, paid my dues, and 
you can show up as a guest. I think to most clubs, unless they're a closed organization for some reason, some of them are like within companies or have specific goals, but a lot of them are open. So you could attend as a guest and I showed up as a guest and I talked just a, a little bit, maybe about a, two minutes or so the first day. And then I immediately signed up, paid my dues and immediately signed up to give a five to seven minute speech for the next meeting, which was just on Wednesday. So that was the first time I like memorized a talk and just went up and talked without any notes or anything like that. I thought it was going to be a lot harder to remember what I wanted to say. I practiced the speech maybe three to four times and I knew what I was going to say. I misspoke a couple times, but I only said, um, one time in five minutes and 30 seconds, which absolutely blew my mind because I, I used to say filler words all the time. I used to say, you know, constantly. It was like every third phrase I would say, you know, but I'm really cleaning it up. And once you think about it and pause, it's okay. Especially when you're talking to a, a crowd, it's okay to pause, let people process what, what you're saying. So I have a lot of improvements to, to do, but I think overall I've cleaned up my speaking and probably my videos and podcasts will improve as a result. There may be longer pauses, but that is better usually than filling it with some bullshit filler word. So Toastmasters is awesome. I wish I would have joined 15, 20 years ago when I first heard about it because I was generally shy to talk. I would get very nervous. I think the nervousness is not going to necessarily go away, but it's not debilitating. I'm not going to freak out as much. Just being calm is it's going to be just fine. I, I'm feeling like it's sort of a superpower since I used to get a lot more nervous in general. So let me just mention again that I do have a phone number that you could call in 406-813-0613 to ask questions. It'll be played on the podcast and couple, I'm going to give you a couple calls to action. So check out my podcast. It's called The Doug Show opposed to YouTube, where a lot of times people only watch half of the videos at best. On the podcast, you have the ability to do something else. And you could actually listen to a full interview, like an hour and 20 minute interview with Matt, or an hour with uh, Morton Storgard, who I'll be playing a clip from him in just a second. But the podcast is where I can do longer form conversations and not feel so constrained by an algorithm where I'm trying to get you to keep watching the next video or the next 10 seconds. It's really hard to keep people engaged on video. And I'm a YouTube consumer myself, so I know I, I skip uh, a lot of videos. And if I get halfway through and I'm not super hooked, I'm gone. So I can appreciate how hard it is to, you know, watch these long videos. Okay, let me get to some of the questions here. And don't forget, if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, I'd love to have you aboard as a subscriber. And uh, as some is asking about the interview with Amelia, I think it'll be coming out on the 26th of March. So I was just emailing with her and I'm going to be doing an interview with her for her channel coming up soon. And Usam is from Pakistan, says, I'm great. You're great too, buddy. Thanks for watching. Hope you're subscribed. Joe says, I just created my 15th blog post and I think I have used too many affiliate links. I saw a drop in traffic within three days, traffic half from 120 to half from 120 per day to 60. Can your site recover? Yes. Don't use so many affiliate links. I think you, since you know the problem, just remove those affiliate links. Additionally, it may not be related. So remove the affiliate links. You shouldn't have that many, assuming a average length of content. Don't use too many. But at the same time, just because your traffic went from 120 per day to 60, it may have been other things. 
there's a lot of stuff going on in the news these days. So people may be slightly distracted at this point in time. By the way, if people want to get a hold of all the templates and systems that I use, you can go to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, enter your name and email address, and then I'll send you the templates. They are extremely useful. You literally can build and run a site. All the details are right there in all my templates. So I, I don't sell those. I just give them away for free to add value. Hopefully you'll you'll trust me. You'll sign up for that email list and you'll you'll dig the content. Chunky Moose, what's up? Asim says that I am looking very fresh, funky, and the video quality has improved. Super. And Joe mentions across the whole site that the that your traffic has dropped. So yeah, I would recommend, you know, don't put too many affiliate links, as we mentioned, but it could be related to other things. So that's one of those, it's called, uh, I think, confirmation bias. So you think that it's from a specific reason because you just took that action. There are many different biases. So it could be a combination of a few of them, by the way. But you have an idea that this is the reason that it happened. And then you have a little bit of evidence that the traffic dropped, but it could be completely something different. It could be the day of the week. I don't know how long the, the traffic has been at that level, but essentially you got to, you got to look at the data, make the improvements and then see what happens, but it may be completely unrelated. You may remove the additional affiliate links the traffic goes back up, but it could have been related to something else. Timing is funny. Gaz is on. What's happening? All right. Another quick plug. So Motion Invest is giving away a site. There's a link in the description. And I won't go too in-depth, but they're giving away a site worth about $6,000. It's making $200 per month. So I encourage you to check it out. And on the note of uh, content, a lot of people do ask about content and feel free to ask some questions about that. But I was talking to my friend, Alex Cooper from WP Eagle. His YouTube channel is fantastic. He's doing this public case study, which is bananas in my opinion, but I interviewed him. That interview is coming out on Monday. It's in depth talking about his case study specifically. And the cool part, everyone mark your calendar, by the way, mark your calendar. If you're not subscribed, you want to subscribe just so you can check out the interview with Alex. I did a teardown of a site. I analyzed some of the keywords and I'm going to be doing some analysis of his backlinks as well. So the interview is coming out Monday and there's going to be at least three, maybe four other videos all related to a site me auditing, analyzing, talking about what he's done, talking about things that I think he can improve on. I give him some props, you know, <laughs> I let him know where he's doing some excellent work. And the guy's a WordPress designer. So we would expect the design to be top notch. I think he uses Elementor and a couple other bells and whistles. Not my style personally, I hate page builders and all the extra bullshit on there, but Alex knows what he's doing. He has a shitload of tutorials on it. So anyway, this is Alex Cooper talking about content for Best Roof Box. That's his public site. Okay, we're up to about 85. I've got a few more in the in the queue at the moment. They're just being edited and being written and, and whatever. I'm trying to add maybe five every couple of weeks, something like that. It really depends on my workload and how quickly my writers can get, get stuff over to me. I've got a big list of stuff that I want written. It's just a case of getting it written and, and getting it uh, edited. I only have one editor at the moment and uh, one writer, so it's a bit slow. But, um, yeah, just regularly putting the content out. I mean, I've got the ambition of maybe getting it up to two, three, four hundred articles. I, I don't know, as, as big as I possibly can. As I said, there is limitless, really, in ideas in terms of the content that I can produce around roof boxes. Very good. And... It sounds like most of them are sort of product focused. Do you know the percentage of like product versus informational type content? I'd say it's probably at least 85% product focused. Okay. Uh, um, cool. There are a few 
few articles that aren't roof boxes <laughs> reduced uh i'm sorry aren't a roof box focused but i'm just trying to see if any of them are performing well in my uh analytics not really no they are generally all product focused they're, they're buyer's guides i'd say how long are most of the buyer's guides they're between 1000 and 2000 words something like that okay and have you experimented with like um like shorter content under a thousand or very long content maybe over three thousand words just curious yeah i've got a few that are, are short maybe five six hundred words i've not got a couple of them uh, not not more than a couple of them i've got a couple of long ones i did a big guide on thule uh, which is a big manufacturer of roof boxes that seems to be doing okay so i called that the ultimate guide to the thule roof boxes because i noticed there are a lot of questions in google all around thule like are they waterproof how do they make them uh, how do you pronounce thule all those <laughs> was it thule or thule i don't know so i thought i'd package all those questions together into one article and, and call it the ultimate guide but yeah that's like 14th on my uh list of of content that's pulling in traffic so i don't know i don't know whether it's worth always investing in these longer in longer articles i don't know i'm still kind of finding my feet i guess sure and then well you, you sort of described like that particular ultimate guide it sounded like you just did research on the questions and then answered those do you is that usually how you format such a guide or was it that a one-off case that's normally how i'd approach it yeah i'd see a, a lot of questions around a particular theme and then i'd just use that as the subheadings within an article so yeah i could have had maybe four or five six hundred word articles but I thought in that particular case, I'd just put them all together into one and, and see what happens. Because I was hoping that quite often you see when people um, do a search on Google with a question, sometimes it's not the, the main title of that article that comes up, but there'll be a hot link on Google or a quick link that jumps you straight to that question on that article. And that's what I was kind of hoping to get that kind of that, that extra little link that you get on Google where it's got the article, but then it's got, you know, skip straight to the answer to this question. Okay. I'm not sure if I've achieved it on that article. I probably need to look into it a bit, bit more detail. But yeah. All right. That was the lovely Alex Cooper over at WP Eagle. Please check out his channel if you have not in the past and keep it lookout. Like I said, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so that you can get notified about that video when it comes out on Monday, plus all the other videos where I tear down his site and talk about all the things that he did wrong. <laughs> I talk about the things that he did right too. I mean, he's doing pretty good. He's making a few hundred bucks. I think uh, the valuation of the site is something like $37,500. So it's no joke. He's only been working on it for like one year and he had sort of a slow start. I mean, everyone has to remember, you know, the first four or five months are gonna be pretty slow. You're going to be either investing a lot of time or money. That is just the name of the game. And basically, if you put your time in, then it'll it'll pan out often. It'll usually work out okay. And let's see, Asim asked a question, which <laughs> which seems interesting. So I'm gonna. This is what I do. I think my wife hates it, but I think I pick apart questions <laughs> like this. I don't do this in real life, but because it'd be a total asshole move. But here on YouTube, we, we have to make it interesting. So ASIM asked this. ASIM's awesome, by the way. So Doug, I just heard from HREFs that I need to keep publishing content regularly, but it's against what we do with niche sites as we only post 30 a niche. What do I have to say about that? Well, I have so many problems with your question that I'm not sure where to begin, but let me reframe it. So number one, if you would like to publish content regularly, you can do that. Number two, I don't know what you mean by we only publish 30 articles per niche. That doesn't make sense to me. I've never said anything like that ever. In fact, most of my sites have hundreds of articles. So as far as only publishing 30 articles, that is your own personal decision. If someone else has mentioned to do that, I can't comment on it specifically. As far as publishing content regularly, I don't find that that is required. I think for certain niches, it can be great to do. For certain topics, it's smart. As far as 
an SEO benefit other than having more content. I don't think Google weights or ranks your site higher because you're publishing on a regular basis, not to my knowledge. So just keep that in mind. Publishing regularly is totally fine, but it is not required. And if you want to have more than 30 posts or you want to have fewer than 30 posts, that is totally up to you. As far as I know, I've never said to only publish 30 posts. So, all right, cool. As we are moving on, I will mention if you would like me to review your site, I will do it, but I don't, I don't do it for free. So I should have prefaced that, but basically you could hire me to audit your site. I generally only want to work with people that I can actually help. So if you have a site running already, usually that's the best case scenario because I could go in and tell you what to change and get results quickly. All right. So you want to get results a little more quickly. If you have a site running, then it can go in and analyze it much like I will be doing with Alex's site, best roof box. So, all right, moving on, I will, let's see, I think I got another sweet clip from a good friend of mine, Ron Stefanski over at the one hour professor. He's been putting out some fantastic videos on his YouTube channel. He publishes income reports and he has since the very beginning. That was 2014. The fall of 2014, he started his blog. He wasn't making much money. In fact, he had some pretty high expenses for a few months before he turned any sort of positive uh, revenue, I guess profit you would call it. But he is now making about 20K per month profit. So after all his expenses, he's still pulling in you know, 20, 20K, which is super impressive. In this clip, he is talking about not link building and getting to $16,000 per month. That's what he was making at the time of the interview. So this is back in the archives a little bit. And I encourage you, by the way, everyone, you can check out the full interview with Matt. You can check out the full interview with Alex next week. And then this interview with Ron is available right now. So if you go to my channel and there's a little search bar within my channel, you can search for Ron Stefanski. You can search for Matt and Money Lab, and you should be able to find full interviews, long form interviews. People really dig them. It's amazing. People watch you know that length of a video. A lot of folks uh, like to work and have it playing in the background to motivate them. A few people have emailed me that. So this is Ron Stefanski from One Hour Professor. I think that's bananas. <laughs> no, just to, to say that, yeah. uh, to say link building doesn't matter at all, in my personal opinion and experience, this isn't just opinion. This isn't, you know, this is something that I've lived. Um, link building will get you there faster. I guess is what you could say. Like, yes, you can create a ton of content. And if you, if you do, if you use the KGR, the keyword golden ratio, you will get rankings, you will get up there and yes, you will. But even though you're getting served for those relevant results, and even though you may be getting, you know, views on your website, what are the chances of that person's a webmaster? What are the person that that webmaster is going to link to you? Not very high. So like some people say, Oh, I don't do link building. I, I, I will say, and Doug, you know a lot about the history. I think I've overdone link building at the past at times, a little too hard. Um, and, you know, we could talk about that later or whatever. But for the most part, when it comes to link building, I personally feel like it's an absolute necessity. You don't have to go crazy on it. But like after like six months, you're going to find if, if you are just creating content, you're going to be writing to nothing and you're not going to see much. Like I have a website right now that I'm working on. Uh, we have... I'm trying to think. I think it's about 80 articles, 90 articles right now. I am getting maybe one visit a day, maybe. And it's been about three months. But I, I know that that's okay because I'm going to do link building and I'm going to kind of build it up. So I think link building is a requirement personally. I think that you have to at least do some link building um, in order to be really successful. That's how I feel. Cool. And I think because we have so many questions on that, we may hold off on some of the link building details because I think we could just, I mean, actually someone just said, just talk about link building all day um, in yeah, one of the comments could. that was yeah. Josh. But yeah. Um, yeah, basically I tend to agree with you. You know, you can get away with not building links, but if you build links, it's just like putting 
you know, gas on the fire it is. or it really is. or something, some other highly flammable thing that's like useful. Like it's, yeah. I think people like the idea because they don't know how to do it or it seems scary or it's, they want to do terrible. less work. Right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like, it's like sales because it's like link building there. If you get a one to 3% conversion, so that means every hundred targets, you get one to three of them to link back to you. That's pretty average decent. I mean, I don't, that's not, that's not completely terrible. Like in that number, it's like, can you sit there and deal with all that rejection over and over and over? Like really good people are getting seven to 10%, but like, that's not, you know, one out of every 10 isn't very encouraging, you know, yeah. like yeah, it's yeah. tough. So like, yeah, you really, I think a lot of people don't want to do it because it's just full of rejection. It's not fun. I love it. I don't know why. And I'm glad I love it. I don't even know why it makes me tick, but I love it because I, I think it's because I know all my competitors aren't doing it. They're not focused on it and they don't, they don't really focus on it enough. They don't think it's important enough. And I can tell you definitively mm -hmm. 1000%. It is extremely important because I have websites where I don't do it and nothing's happening. And then I start doing it. And then guess what? All my rankings start climbing. It always happens always. And that's, that goes for Amazon websites, or Amazon affiliate websites that goes for informational websites, all these, any type of website, it always is going to help because it just gives you more authority. That's all it does. So, yes. And, um, yeah, we could, like I said, we could go on and on and on and on, but just, um, for the main site that, that we've been talking about, do you have an idea like how many referring domains are pointing to it just to give people an idea, the craziness that is going I'm inside. I'm gonna have to look on <laughs> Ahrefs actually for that one. That's all uh, right. I've got I've got it up here right now. Uh, so at this point, I have 419 referring domains to that one. Um, yes. So that's the total. But I will say, and I don't know anyone else who's like maybe a little bit more advanced. It's like watching this. I've been getting more spam links lately. So like of those, maybe 350 are like valid. Um, I don't know why. It seems like there's like been an influx across all my websites that more people have been doing that. So like probably valid, like 350, 360 domains total. Um, but that actually, that website, I did a, a decent amount of link building in the beginning. I haven't really done much link building other than that because in in terms of the internet, I'm basically the number one result for that particular like term and that particular niche. I don't really need to keep doing the link building because a lot of my content is ranking. So now I am getting those links organically, which is like the coolest feeling in the world, you know, because you're just like, oh, my gosh, I just got a link. Like I get links from like a government website. All of a sudden it's like, well, hello there, you know, like, right, thank right. you. Like, that's awesome. So nowadays I don't really do much for that one, but it's already reached that top level. You know, when you're in a, when you're at a website in the beginning and you, you're not even close to that top level, you absolutely have to do link building in my personal opinion. So. Do you know how many, I don't know if you'll remember this, but do you know how many referring domains or links you got before you hit that sort of critical mass where like now you are the authority and people will link to your site because you have the best information? So I had a very uh, strange um, growth trajectory with this particular website to backtrack just a little bit. When I created this website, I created it, I started to get a little bit of organic traffic uh, without doing any link building. So it does work. I, you know, in the beginning, I wasn't doing any. What ended up happening was this particular resource, this particular website, it actually went very, very, very viral on Facebook. Um, and it's, to be clear, it's a resource. This is an informational resource. This wasn't like, you know, like, oh, uh, nine ways to do this. Number six will surprise you. It wasn't the, what those types of posts. It was like a data, like a database type of resource helping people with some particular information. It went viral on Facebook like crazy. And what ended up happening was, I mean, this like shut down my server a few times. Like it was like a big deal. Like I was getting two, 300 people on it at every second of the website, which was crazy. Um, so, but the whole thing was that basically went up and then it went down because that's what viral stuff does. And then after that is when I thought about link building because it was like, okay, it made all that money. It's a great resource. Now some people know about it, but I need to make this stick. How can I make it stick? And I already knew about link building, but I wasn't doing it. Like most people don't want to do it. And I was like, oh, I'm just not going to. But then at that point, I was like, man, this can really earn some decent money if I figure this out. So then I started to do link building. So at that point, I would say, I think I probably only got like maybe 30 to 50 links total, um, somewhere in that range for it to really be like start you know, like, like critical mass solidifying in the, in the search results. 
And then I've just been adding so much content onto it every, you know, every month or whatever for so long now, you know, that it like I kept ranking for more and more and then more links kept coming in. And now it's just getting more and more and more authoritative, like naturally. I don't even really have to do much anymore. So awesome. All right. That was Ron Stefanski over at One Hour Professor. Like I said, do check out his YouTube channel. Let him know that I sent you there. He's doing a lot of videos and the guy, he's a teacher, professor. He's, he actually taught college courses and stuff. Well-educated, super smart, and he's uh, crushing it working for himself. The you know great thing is his videos are you know concise. <laughs> and since he's a a better teacher, I think I think you I got to look out. I think his channel is going to grow a lot faster than mine because I'm so deep in the weeds talking about nonsense <laughs> that, that casual observers of my channel probably don't know what I'm talking about most of the time. And uh, Ron is, has a way to break it down and make it a little more approachable and different topics. So we kind of do a few different things. Do check out his full interview. So there's been a few, but if you go to my channel, you can search for all the long form ones and people found those very educational overall. Quick plug for another one of my friends, I just want to point out income reports. I don't publish income reports, but Ron does. And my other friend, John Dykstra does as well. And I'm just going to pop over here. So he's over at Fat Stacks blog. And there's a link in the description, by the way. So there's a link in the description so you can go to the same page that I'm displaying here. And he publishes income reports and they are pretty you know, beefy overall. Uh, he's doing really, really well. So he has seven niche sites. He has a portfolio. And let's just scroll down here. Scroll down and see how he's doing. So total revenue is 40K. And then his expenses are about 7,000. So his net income is 32. Now, a lot of times January is lower than for as far as earnings and sometimes traffic just across the board, whether you're dealing with an ad-based monetization method or affiliates or something else, a lot of times traffic's just lower. A lot of times revenue is lower. So you end up with slightly lower revenue. And in this case, I think I mentioned maybe that uh, John is making regularly like 40K per month or more. January is a little bit lower. Now, if we if we go back, we could probably see that December is a little bit better. And we'll just take a quick look. And I was gonna say, just you know, feel free to to peruse these. He's not as long form as Ron's income reports, but they're still very thorough. I mean, these are not short by any means. Let's see, what did he make? So his net income, yeah, so five thousand higher. In January. So this was December 37K profit. Pretty insane. And, you know, he shares a ton of information, a lot of pictures, you know, a lot of pictures, a lot of graphs. People like pictures and graphs. So let's see. You got a few more questions here. And folks, let me know if you have any more. Um, Tanu asked about whether the quality of hiring a writer based on an hourly basis or a project fixed bid basis is impactful on the quality. It shouldn't impact the quality, but it depends probably on the specific writer. And Tan Tanu mentions that Spencer Hawes hires writers based on an hourly basis. And you're curious to know why you're the boss. So you can hire people however you want to. So if you want to pay them a fixed amount, then it sort of makes them write it a little bit faster. So in theory, the quality could be a little bit lower. But if you have a long-term relationship, it shouldn't really make a huge difference. Some articles are going to take a few minutes more. Some are going to take a few minutes less. Spencer probably, and I don't know this specifically, but Spencer probably is working long-term with some writers. So sometimes an article needs to be 5,000 words. Sometimes it needs to be 1,200 words. So in that case, it may makes sense to just have an hourly rate that you pay and you can have the person write whatever you need and you don't have to renegotiate any different length of article or different format of working or anything like that. So that's my hunch. I would ask Spencer directly 
um, and see why. And I imagine it'll be similar to my answer. That's just how he wanted to format it. And it's the most fair for the writer in general. Okay, it doesn't look like there's too many questions um, popping up, but I'll, I'll pause here for a second. I interviewed a new friend of mine named Morton, and he has an up and coming channel. So it was a very popular interview. I, was, I wasn't surprised in that people were interested in it, but Morton's a, a new person on YouTube. No one really knew his name. People shouldn't recognize him. While I have some big hitters that uh, are super well-known and I get very few views on them. So sometimes it could be the thumbnail. Sometimes it could be the title. But I think in this case, you know, Morton's awesome, number one. And then the other part is the topic was pretty good and the thumbnail was outstanding. So Morton published 177 articles in about eight months, and he paid, I think, roughly $9,000 for it. He's making um, some decent money at this point. He's still not ROI positive overall, but he has an awesome foundation for growing the site, and he's a 10-year like, veteran in online marketing, so he knows his way around. In this clip we're just going to talk about like traveling and being productive because he's been working as a digital marketer for years he and his wife have been able to travel quite a bit so here's morton talking about traveling as a digital marketer so we've been married for 13 years so we've been together for a long time and and now only a kid is three years old. So for 10 years, we were together doing stuff mostly online. So we have yeah, been traveling in Asia, Africa, and the States and Europe and, and, and many places. So we typically go for one to two or three months at a time. And we, we've been trying different different styles. We've been RVing a lot in Europe. And and when we go further away, I mean, in, in Asia and Thailand, we typically just rent it something nice because it's much cheaper. And in the States, we have some friends we could, we could stay with. So... So we, we tried many different things and I think it's just, it's just a great way to, or it, it's definitely one of the, one of the freedom, freedom or the perks that comes with this way of earning money that I absolutely love. And my, my wife also has like a YouTube travel channel and she traveled a lot before we met also, and she really wanted to travel. So it's, I would say it's mostly her who's the primary driver to getting us on the road all the time. And. And I, I love that because if I didn't have her, I would probably just be in my cave, just vlogging all day, you know, or doing, doing stuff on my own. <laughs> yeah. What, what kind of challenges did you run into traveling, especially like in an RV, right? With connectivity, knowing that, you know, potentially at the time, maybe you had some clients or obviously your own yeah. work that you need to do. Yeah, I, I started telling all my SEO clients that I would not be working from their office space, like any any time. And I also, I so I always told them this at the very first meeting before we did any sort of agreement on anything, just so they knew. And and then I, I told them that I would love to do like a monthly reporting and we could definitely do that on Skype, but but only if they if they needed it. So so over time, I think one thing that went really well was that I had fewer and fewer and bigger and bigger clients. So in the beginning, it was maybe 15 clients. And in the end, it was just like a handful of bigger clients that I had worked with and doing link building for, for years. So there was, there was a lot of trust. I would basically just send them a list of links that I had acquired over the last month. So that got easier and easier as we started traveling. So, and I think... Yeah, connectivity issues definitely in in Africa and also in many places, you know, all over the place. But but I was yeah, I was, I was surprised to have super super fast internet in Thailand. It was just a fantastic place to work. As probably many, I, I know there's a ton of marketers there. Yeah, <laughs> I hear I hear good things. Yeah, you've traveled like all over. How many countries have you guys been to? 
Yeah, I think the last time I counted it was around 30, something like that. But it's it's easy to tick up a lot of countries when because, I mean, just if I drive two hours in each direction, Denmark, I mean, Norway, Sweden, Germany, Holland, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to count a lot of countries here in Europe. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, when we were doing like the pre-interview, I was telling you I drove from uh, Colorado to Alaska, which is like 6,000 yeah. miles, you know? Yeah. Um, one way. And basically, <laughs> I, I was in two countries. <laughs> two countries. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 6, yeah so, so you should count the states, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And and I am, you know, a self-centered American. So did you have any favorite places in the U.S. that you travel to? Well, I, I have mostly been in California and Florida so far. So and, and also been in Chicago. I've actually been to, to, to your area also. I, I was in Denver. I don't know how far that is, but I was up in, in the Rocky Mountains uh, at one. But that, that was a long time ago. But but I, I absolutely love Florida and Chicago. No, sorry, and California. But I mean, who who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, well, I was going to say those are those are very like sort of diverse states in general. Um, if you're in sort of northern, like the panhandle of Florida, totally different than like Fort Lauderdale, yeah. Miami, the Keys. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it may as well be like you know, three different states and then same deal with uh, California too. So yeah, great places. Uh, nice weather, nice weather compared to. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and that's also because we're in Denmark, you know, we're so far up north, we're close to Norway. And so, so we have, I typically say we have like 10 months of winter <laughs> and, and, you know, in the winter, the sun is hardly getting up. It's maybe only uh, sunlight here, six, seven, eight hours and something like that. And it's just like the sun is just, you know, hitting the horizon and going down again. So, so we try to always go to somewhere warm, like Thailand or Africa or Florida, California and during the winter months just sure. to get some, some warm Very weather. <laughs> All right, that was Morton Storgard. Do check out his uh, channel. I did a full interview with him and he goes in depth on how he hired his content team. So Mari hopped on just a minute ago and says, am I doing well if I discover that my one month old blog has 500 impressions in a month based on the search console? And I asked how many visitors and you have 70. Sure, that's fine. I think at one month it almost doesn't matter, like you don't have enough data yet. But the fact that you are getting some impressions is a good thing overall. You have visitors on your site, that is also a good thing. So I would say keep moving forward and it's interesting. I, I get this question in a few different forms all the time. People are very interested how they compare to other folks and usually, everyone's average. <laughs> everyone's average. It's unusual when someone does a little better. Typically, when they are doing a little better, like Derek was on here earlier. Derek has a site that's five months old. He's making about $1,000 per month, if I remember right. He's only getting about 100 visitors per day, which sounds amazing, right? He's doing really well. This is not his first rodeo. He's been working online for a few years. He was one of the first people I met like way back in the day. So I would say that it's a dangerous game to compare yourself to other people. It's hard not to do it. It's hard not to do it in general. But if you, Mari, if you if you have 70 visitors in, the, in your first month, that's pretty darn good. That's great. You're getting like two visitors per day. Fantastic. You must be using the keyword golden ratio. Cool. And then the other part is it's basically useless. So Ab, Abakar, Ab, Abukar asks, I have a thousand impressions in a week. Is that okay? And two to three visitors per day. The thing is, if I tell you yes or no, is that going to change your actions at all? I mean, I don't know if there's any value for me giving people reassurance. I'm not a cheerleader. I, I mean, I, I'm not a good great um, motivator. I can tell you about, <laughs> I can tell you about what I think about certain things, but me saying, yeah, you're doing a great job or no, you suck. Uh, not super helpful in my opinion, but maybe it is, maybe, maybe it is super helpful for some people. Okay. We'll see what I could do here for Umar. Umar asked two questions. So he put a little Q1 and Q2. So I'll try and answer these. Uh, I may not be able to. 
what tools do you recommend for a site audit? I have 24 articles and only 800 keywords are ranking under 100, but I'm not getting any traffic. It's close, or it's like four to five per day. I don't recommend anything for a site audit. I think you use your eyes. I mean, I don't use tools to audit sites, so I can't comment on that. Look yourself and figure it out. You know, figure out what you're doing wrong. Are you keyword stuffing? Are you in that? That is a bullshit answer. I know you're like, Hey, how can I get some help? And you, you have to go either. You have to find someone who knows how to analyze your content or you have to figure out how to do it yourself. Those are your two options that I know of. There might be tools that can audit your site, but I have a feeling they won't be able to do the nuanced analysis that you actually need. Number two, you say that you're doing blog commenting with Web 2.0. Is this enough? No. And I would say you probably have a flawed approach, all right? You probably have a flawed approach. If you're doing blog commenting with Web 2.0s, you're probably doing a lot of shit wrong. That is an old school way to do it. And is there anything else that you need to do? Yes. You need to be doing so many more things. It's beyond the scope of what I can cover today, but I would say go back to square one, reassess where you're learning this stuff from, because it sounds like you're way, way far away from anything that I do or any of my students do, or at least that I would recommend that my students do. Phil, what's up? How's it going? Um, you'll have to watch on replay. It's dinner time in the UK. Cool, thanks for hopping on, Phil. Tiff asks this, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Tiff says, do I recommend Azon Booster or Human is free themes to use for Amazon affiliate? I don't, I'm not familiar with either of those, but I'm gonna say no. I, I, I really don't recommend those. Um, Azon Booster sounds a little bit, um, a little bit scammy, like, I, I don't know. Uh, it's it's dangerous. Um, it's dangerous for me to comment on stuff that I don't know about, but I could tell you that they are not required. You don't need them. I would be really surprised if they had like some really good uh, value. <laughs> like, I, I just can't imagine. And if free themes often are going to have security issues, not always, but if, you, if you're just getting a random yeah, let me take that down a notch. If you're just getting random free themes, they may not be the best to use. If you're getting a good free theme, then it may be totally fine if it's well updated and well maintained. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But Tiff, I, I don't know those at all. A couple more questions I see popping up. So Paul asks, is the Derek interview on the channel now trying to find it? No, I've never interviewed Derek. So never, never talked to him. Next, uh, Marin says, in Paul, I'm not sure. I'll double check with, um, with Derek. I may interview him in the future, but there was nothing on the calendar. Marin says, when I hire a writer, how can you be sure that it isn't plagiarized? Do I use some tools? So I use Grammarly. There's a link in the description. The premium version has plagiarism uh, checker. So you can paste the text in. It'll tell you how much is plagiarized and from where. A lot of times you'll find like phrases here and there. It may say like 1% is copied from here, 1% from there. A lot of times those are transitional phrases and it doesn't really matter. I have caught a couple, one or two writers that lifted sen sentences. So I, if you don't want to use a tool, there's several out there by the way, but if you don't want to use a tool, what I used to do when my budget was super low, I would copy a sentence or two, put it into the Google search and try and find that exact sentence in quotes. You got to use quotes to find that exact phrase. And if it showed up, then I know that they copied it. So I would just spot check here and there. Spot check here and there. And Marin, 
that this is a question. So I'm going to point everyone. Here's the call to action here. All right. Go over to initiateproject.com slash FAQ. Virtually, not all of them, but virtually all the questions that I answered today, I already answered over there. And that's the interesting thing. I used to do these live streams every week and I would only answer questions. I wouldn't do the clips, which I didn't have the, the cool software that I have now. And I would just answer the questions. And a lot of times they were not only the similar questions over and over again, but sometimes they were the exact same question at the beginning of a live stream, at the end of a live stream. So that's why I've tapered it down to just hit super relevant ones to the conversation for my own sanity, just in general. And I got to I gotta say, sometimes, not anyone here, all the people that are on this live stream right now, you're wonderful. You're asking smart questions. But sometimes there are some dumb questions that come through. And it's like, dude or dudette, did you not, like, have you ever, like, tried to just Google it? Like, this is the most basic thing. Like, come on, you got to look this shit up before you ask the question. But now I just skip them. So now I just skip them. All right. I'm going to see if we, any others came through. Yeah, like I said, everyone here is wonderful. No one asked any silly questions. Tiff says, uh, you're leaning towards rehub. And rehub is pretty nice. I think I've, I've talked about it here and there. I have an article where I talk about the themes that I aim uh, towards. And generally, I want simple. Rehub has a lot of stuff going on. But it is one of those themes that is literally recommended and noted from Amazon Associates. I don't love themes that are overly complicated with too many features that are confusing. You have all these decisions to make. And really, you just want that theme to stay out of the way. You just want that theme to stay out of the way. And moving on, oh, we have some nice other questions and comments coming through. Oh, Gustavo, uh, one of the fine students in Five Figure Niche Site. There are sites which check for plagiarism for free. You just have to paste the complete text and hit a button. So, yep, you could definitely find some ways to do it for free. And thanks, everyone, for hopping on. Be sure you're subscribed to the channel so you can see and be notified. Click the bell for the notifications because I'm going to be publishing some awesome videos next week. I'm going to be publishing like, I think it'll be at least four on Monday. Interview with Alex Cooper. We are going to analyze the site, or I am. I'm going to dig into some of his backlinks. I'm going to share some of the keywords that he's ranking for. And it should be, I'm hoping people are really going to enjoy it. You never know until you know you get to you get to have the eyes of real viewers on the videos. I think they're a little tighter. Some of my videos go on a long time, but these are tight. I believe all of them are under about 15 minutes. One of them may be a little bit long, but it's it's gonna be good. So be sure you're subscribed. Have a great weekend, everyone. Wash your hands. Chuck. <clears throat> Chuck, thanks for the comment. And thanks for everyone for hopping on. Oh, and I see Mari says one more thing here. What do, what do I think about Pinterest for getting traffic? I don't spend any time on Pinterest, so I don't like it. <laughs> I know a lot of people do get um, quite a bit of traffic from Pinterest. And I asked a couple of those very smart people to write some posts for me about Pinterest. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to paste this over for you, Mari, um, because it'll be super helpful. Let me, let me get the link for you. I got to get the link and it'll be, it's always fun to watch someone type. So there's a few articles on this on Niche Site Project. And I can point you in that direction and you can learn from people that actually know more about Pinterest than me, but not my thing. And I do know just in general, Pinterest, I mean, it's a search engine, right? That's what everyone says. It's a search engine, so you could definitely get traffic from it. 
That said, there are many different things you have to consider as far as algorithm updates. Because Pinterest is a search engine, there are still algorithm updates to deal with. So I think one of those came out recently. I know some people have dropped in traffic. I'm sure others have gone up. And there's a couple articles there, Mari. So do check it out. Do check it out for me. You can learn a lot from people that are smarter than me. All right, yeah, everybody wash your hands. Don't cough on people. Mike, good to have you on. Paul, what's up? Yeah, everyone, leave comments on all my videos, right? So you're gonna have plenty of time inside. Everyone's locked down. Watch the videos, leave comments. I may even do one of those super long videos where I put together like all the interviews that I did with say, Christy or maybe even uh, Marty. Put all of them together, they're like three hours long. People watch them, it's totally insane. People watch those videos and I love it. And uh, Personal Finance Minimalist says, you've watched over 100 hours of my videos and you listen while you work and it's the first live stream. Oh. PFM, that is awesome. Thank you, thank you. That is amazing. All right, everyone, have a great weekend. Stay healthy.